Let me preface this story by saying, first of all, that I truly and genuinely love my father-in-law. I am really grateful to know him. He is a kind and generous man, and even though we disagree about some things and we enjoy debating politics together, even in our disagreement, I love and respect him. Let me also preface this story by saying that our house does not have air conditioning. <laughs> so it was during that freak, record-breaking heat wave that we had in June, and it was late at night. I don't really stay up much late anymore, but Stephanie and I were both up late because it was so hot and we couldn't sleep, and we were trying to keep the windows and the, everything opened up for as long as possible to the cool night air before we locked up for the night. And so I was laying in the hammock in our backyard, and I was stripped down to my shorts, still uncomfortably warm in the 80-plus degree weather at midnight in June, I might remind you. And I was thinking, as I stared into that inky sky, that this is going to become more normal. And that made me sad. And I was hot, and I was tired, and I was unable to sleep, and I got angry. And I got angry at my father-in-law. Because, you see, he doesn't believe that climate change is a human problem. We've discussed this many times. I've showed him the graphs, and I've pointed to peer-reviewed studies, and I've talked with him about geologic history and the carbon cycle, and he remains convinced that the science is still out on whether or not this is a human-made problem, whether there's, any, whether there's anything we can or should do about it. And so I suppose... I picked him to get angry at on that hot June night because he's one face that I can put on this large segment of humanity that thinks that way. I've had this conversation with him a number of times and there seems to be nothing I can do to convince him. So laying there in the heat and the sweat and the vain hope of a cool breeze, I suppose I felt hopeless. Because if I can't convince one person one person whom I actually love and who loves me, what are the chances that we can convince anybody and anything will ever happen? And so in my hopelessness, on that sweltering night, I got angry. And I read today these words from James, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Your anger does not produce God's righteousness. And I can't help but think about that night. And I can't help but hear James speaking straight to me, straight to us. Outrage in our world is ubiquitous. With all that's going on, with the pandemic, with this long overdue reckoning for racial justice, recent discoveries of mass graves at Native American boarding schools, the climate change crisis, the refugee crisis, the homelessness epidemic, there's plenty to be outraged about. There's so much happening in our world that should be so easily solved if we could just agree on how to do it. I think that there are probably a lot of us who can relate to my story. We've all got examples of friends or relatives or acquaintances with whom we've had similar conversations to the ones that I've had with my father-in-law. Or perhaps more often than not, those people with whom we've avoided similar conversations. We know that we disagree. We know that we're not going to change one another's minds or accomplish anything other than starting a fight. So it gets hard to justify bringing it up, right? Outrage is so per pervasive that we're getting burnt out on it. But if we don't talk about these things, nothing changes. So reading these words from James today. And speaking as a straight, white, cisgendered man, I have to say it feels like a very privileged thing for me to say that my anger doesn't bring God's righteousness, especially when nothing else has brought God's righteousness either, right? Not logic or reason, not science or research, not empathy, not the legal system, the criminal justice system, the democratic system. When injustice persists, when real people are suffering from the ignorance and the inaction of those in power, how can one not get angry? But I noticed today that James doesn't say, don't get angry. He says, be slow to anger. 
Sometimes anger is justified. Sometimes it's even necessary. But the next thing he says is also true. Our anger does not bring about God's righteousness. Anger, just like the fears and the mistrusts and the greeds and the hatreds that cause all these problems to begin with, is something that arises from within us. Jesus reminds his disciples today that it is those things that come from within us, like things like theft and murder and pride and envy, and it's those things that defile us. To defile literally means to make common. The Pharisees questioned Jesus about why his disciples ate with common hands, which is to say hands not purified by washing. As God's chosen people, they were expected to purify themselves as God is pure. It was a physical reminder of who they were and of whose they were. What Jesus explains to the Pharisees is that we cannot make ourselves pure or impure, clean or unclean, sanctified or defiled. Our anger, like anything else that comes from within, regardless of its intent, is not able to make us or anything else godly. In my anger, I wish that I could somehow make my father-in-law and everyone else who believes what he does come around to my way of thinking. I want to assert my power over them and make them like me. Now the intent may be good, but as the old proverb reminds us, the road to hell is paved, after all, with good intentions. It's the good intentions of generations of colonizers and oppressors, good intentions to subdue the earth, to tame the savages that got us where we are. It is the unbridled belief that I am right and anyone who doesn't agree with me is wrong that has created the problems with which we are now struggling. And so I wonder, how can the anger that created the problems also solve them? One thing I notice in this gospel story is that the human traditions Jesus talks about are so often used to differentiate. They separate clean from unclean, right from wrong, the virtuous from the wicked. It is from outside of these human traditions that Jesus himself comes. And it's Mark who notices, kind of parenthetically, that what Jesus says declares all foods clean. Mark notices that according to Jesus, all foods are the same, all given for nourishment, all capable of providing growth and life. And it makes sense after all, right? Because all foods are created by God. And so I hear this, and I see the contrast between what Jesus says and what the tradition of the elders says, and I start to wonder, could it be that maybe this also applies to all the people created by God? Even the ones who work so hard against God's purposes. I wonder if this isn't why James counsels us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. It's easy to demonize the other, to imagine that only malice or stupidity or some sort of genetic malfunction could possibly cause a person to be so wicked. But that's an assumption that we make in ignorance and our lack of understanding. Now, I'm not suggesting that something like white nationalism or exploitive consumption have merits that we ought to be open to, but have we ever stopped to think about why such destructive belief systems persist in the 21st century? With everything that we have, with everything that we know, why do we keep falling back on these things? Why do so many people adhere to them so tightly? I wonder if people cling to these idols for the same reasons that we each cling to our own. Because there are, these are the tiny gods that we have created and trusted to save us from whatever it might be that frightens us. In fact, I wonder if that's where my own anger in this story comes from, from feeling threatened when another person disparages the gods in whom I trust. Trust. 
even justice itself can become an idol when it causes us to hate and mistrust and fear other people rather than loving them. Love can spark anger, but anger born out of love is fundamentally different than anger born out of frustration or desire to control. I want to change the world, for the better, according to me. But that night, it was, in the, heat in my, it was the heat and my own frustration and hopelessness that bred that anger. Not my love for my father-in-law, or my home, or anything else. I was afraid of death, of extinction, so I became angry. What becomes plain to me in the light of day is that such anger cannot really bring about God's righteousness. To hear the word of truth and to be angered by it and by the lack of our ability to understand it is normal. But to hear that and to be motivated by the anger and not the love is to hear the word and not to do it. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing the truth, and then immediately forgetting what it is. The best my anger can do is to help me enforce my own pale facsimile of righteousness in, that, in God's place. And oddly enough, that's what gives me hope in this story, right? Because my anger cannot bring God's righteousness. In fact, nothing of mine, nothing of me can bring God's righteousness. Even my best intentions are so often defiled with selfish desires. And because I cannot bring God's righteousness, that means I don't have to. I don't have to. I can leave that job to God. And what is God doing? What is God doing in this story? God is sending Jesus to love. That's what we can do. We can love. But even love isn't something that we can just do, something that we can be taught. One cannot learn how to love more fully. One can only experience unconditional love and be opened by it. Not unlike how the stagnant heat of that sweltering June night stoked the, angers of my ang stoked the embers of my anger, the rain of God's perfect love, when it falls on our parched hearts, still sprouts new life and healing. Listening to one another, listening not to rebut, but to understand, is one way to love. Listening has the capacity to bind us together rather than to separate us. It becomes harder to demonize someone whose humanity I've experienced firsthand. It can help us see that although we have differentiated ourselves according to our beliefs and our values and our human traditions, the one who made us has made us all one. In Christ, we are the same. If human action is to divide and separate and differentiate, then God's action is to bring together, to reconcile, to unify, to heal. I don't have a lot of hope in myself to be able to create the world I'd like to see. But I do have hope in that. I have hope that in the love of God, such a world is possible. Whether or not we can get our act together in time to prevent our own extinction, I know that our only hope for doing so lies not in demonizing and reviling one another, because that's the way of death. That's the way of empire that crucifies anyone who stands in its way. What we know, what brings us here today, is the experience that the way of the cross, the way of the crucified, is the way to life. And I trust that even if and when that way leads through death, that it is the way to life.